The scripture reading this morning will be from Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 35. And when the days for their purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, Every firstborn male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death <clears throat> before he had seen the Lord, the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, thou dost let thy bondservant depart in peace according to thy word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Well, let's pray. <coughs> Father, as always, as seems to be our custom, we come before your throne and we simply, and I, I pray, humbly pray, Asking, Father, for you to do the work that only you can do, that only the Holy Spirit can do, only our Lord Jesus can do, only a Holy Trinity can do in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, and within our souls. Meet with us here this morning, I pray. Soften our hearts to receive all that you would have to say. Penetrate our hearts, I pray, move in our midst in such a way that we would only see Jesus. Father, we need you, desperately need you. And Father, as we come out of the holiday season, as we come out of the Christmas season, the Christ must season, um, Father, there's a tiredness, there's um, a little sense of weariness, a little frailty. And we have many in the ministry who have been suffering with some illness and uh, others with grief. They're just burdened by so many things. And I'm praying, Father, that you'll meet with us here. Um, you'll meet with those that are not here through the message this week and minister to our hearts, and minister to our, our bodies. We have many here who are in need of healing. They need a fresh wind from you. My Father, we all do. And so I pray for revival. I pray for renewal. I pray for restoration. I pray for reconciliation, Father, that, um, that the focus of, of the birth of your Son um, will linger uh, longer in our hearts and our minds than it will do in the world in which we live. Um, so many want to turn the page and just move on. May we find ourselves before the throne. May we find ourselves before the manger and still continue to contemplate the wonder of it all. And so for that too, we need your help. Open up your word. Open up our eyes. 
And help us, I pray, to be in the very best place to allow you to move in our very beings. We lift up the service. And we lift up the scriptures. And we lift up Jesus, I pray. We ask this, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. <clears throat> you ever wonder, <clears throat> excuse me, what history looks like in the making? Have you ever sit back and wonder what history looks like in the moment? My guess is that it's pretty ordinary. One day, Martin Luther wakes up. He walks up to the castle door at Wittenberg, takes out a hammer, takes out a nail, and he takes his 95-point thesis, and he nails it to the door. Who would have thought that day was anything other than an ordinary day? Who would know the shockwaves that that thesis would send throughout the church? Who would have known that very day as life went on and people moved on that that 95-point thesis would rock the world? Who would have known that the Reformation would have its origins on that very day? What about Einstein? Long, unkept hair, peculiar habits. A small man, simple stature, easy to walk by, easy to ignore and yet an absolute brilliant mind. Most people looked at this odd man and wrote him off as a silly fool. You ever see a picture of Einstein, you kind of go, ah! Who would have known that this old fool knew something about math, knew a little bit about science? Who would have known that the simple formula E equals MC2 would change the world forever? Who would have known on that ordinary day just another ordinary day, that the age of nuclear power would be born. Who would have known that it would be enough power to light up the entire globe? Who would have known that it would be enough power to destroy the planet? For Einstein, it was probably just another ordinary day. Just another ordinary day at the office. Probably just another day at the office when Thomas Edison invented the light bulb. And yet because of that day, we have a world that can see in the darkest of nights. And just another day at the office when Alexander Graham Bell made his first phone call. And yet today we can communicate around the world with phones carried in our pockets. And some of you have them even now. You have your Bibles on them. No less. Just another day at the office when two young computer geeks discovered language. Not a spoken language, but computer language that would transform the globe. Who would have known that day that the computer age was born in a garage? Who would have known that day that one day we would all be surfers? surfing on the information highway. It seems to me that history in the making, for the most part, goes pretty much unnoticed. I can't help but to think, and I can't help but wondering, what Simeon's history-making moment must, must have looked like. I can't help but to think that it began just like every other day, just like every other ordinary day. I imagine Simeon wakes up in the morning, faces the reality of old age. His first thought to himself is, how can I get these old bones out of this old bed? Ever have that kind of feeling? How can, I get his, how can he get his tired and sore muscles, limber enough to carry him through the day? Seems that life gets harder and harder to navigate for him in his elder years. His strength is failing him. His eyes are failing. And things have become so blurry. 
And then there's his mind. Oh, his mind. What he would give to think clearly again. Because in his old age, he's not as sharp as he once was. And he gets confused so easily. He doesn't understand why he can't remember things from his youth. Or why he can remember things from his youth. But he can't remember what he needs to do this afternoon or where he needs to be. He can remember the joy of his youth. He can remember the features of his father. He can even remember a kiss from his mother. He can remember past events with precision. As if they had just taken place yesterday. And as he gets ready for today, he has a hard time remembering what day it is. And so for Simeon, routines are really important. They keep him busy. They keep him on track. Seven o'clock, he eats his breakfast, mostly pomegranates and figs. Each day, he finds it more and more difficult to feed himself. And he gets frustrated. The pomegranates, well, they just get so sticky. And the figs, if you've ever had figs, well, they become like tar between the fingers. And he tries to pull his fingers apart. But those are arthritic fingers, well, they're just stuck. Because they're so weak. And they're so frail. I remember when my daughter Christina was just, just an infant. And a little baby. And as the babies grow, you know, you just see their little mind trying to figure things out. And they, and they grab food at the table. I remember Christina grabbing food. And I remember her fingers getting stuck. And I could see the little mind working because it was a new experience. And, and they're stuck and trying to figure out how to unstick them. And they realize you just pull them apart. But there, there she is. And she'd look to me like, Daddy, help. Because she didn't quite know what to do. How, how to pull those little fingers apart. But Simeon's frustrated for another reason. He knows how to get his fingers apart. He just doesn't have the strength to separate them any longer. He knows what to do. He just can't seem to do it. And life seems unfair at times. Well, by now it's 9 o'clock. Simeon heads for the Holy City to visit some old friends and, and to chat a while. 10 o'clock, he takes his walk around the Temple Square, sees the old familiar faces. 1 o'clock, Simeon takes his afternoon nap, finds a quiet place to lay down to rest. As soon as late in the afternoon, he heads home to spend time with family. Just another day. The same old routine. Monday he goes to market. Tuesday he weeds the garden. On Wednesday he visits Zacharias and Amos and catches up on life. And so the week goes by. His life has a certain rhythm to it. A certain cadence. And so I imagine that Simeon's day began just like any other ordinary day. And then his life was interrupted. And his routines radically redirected. Scripture tells us that on that day, the Spirit led him to the temple. In the midst of that ordinary day, Simeon hears the most amazing voice. It's a gentle voice. It's a quiet voice. But it's an urgent voice. And it's a powerful voice. Simeon hears the voice of God. Simeon. Go to the temple. Now for a moment, Simeon can't believe his ears. Because over time, those two have dulled with age. And he wonders to himself that maybe he's beginning to hear things. And God speaks to him again. Simeon, go. Now there's no mistaking the message. And there's no mistaking the voice. Because years ago... Simeon had heard that voice. He was younger. Things were clearer. And he had learned to recognize it well. He remembered how that years ago that voice had told him that he would live to see the Messiah. 
And it was a voice that promised him he would not see death until he had laid his eyes upon the Savior. Simeon begins to remember. And with remembering comes incredible clarity. For years that promise had kept him going, kept his hopes alive, kept his faith alive. And even though time has dulled his senses, his spirit's alive and fresh. And Simeon now thinks to himself, this, this has to be the day. This has to be that day that all so long ago, God had whispered into my ear. As if Simeon had almost forgotten. As if Simeon had almost given up. And so with a renewed sense of strength, you can almost picture Simeon running and racing to get ready, running and racing to go to the temple. The old bones find new energy, tired muscles find new youth. And Simeon hurries off to the temple. And people are puzzled by the pace that this man displays. This old man who'd been limping along now seems to be leaping. When they see his focus, they see his determination. But most of all, they see his joy. Simeon is fueled by the promises of God, fueled by the very thought that this ordinary day just might be the day. And with the temple in his sights for the first time in a long, long time, Simeon begins to run. Well, that same morning, a young woman wakes up, and she too has a sense of mission. She too has heard the voice of God, not an audible voice, but a written voice of God. She awakens in the morning, and her first thought is, today's the day. It's been 40 days since the birth of her son. 40 days since that amazing day in Bethlehem. And she's done everything up until now according to the law. And so day today can be and must be no different. Today is the day that she's required by the law to dedicate her son. It's a mystery to her how her son is to be her Lord. And how can it be that she will dedicate her son in the very temple that's built for him? And her mind, too, is pro processing the promises of God. They seem far too big, far too miraculous, far too amazing for the likes of such as her. And so she gets up. She bundles up for the journey. And she, too, is filled with emotion. Uh, she's nervous. She doesn't like the crowds. She doesn't want the attention. But she presses on through the crowds because that's what the law commands. And she presses on because she loves God. And because she loves God, she obeys. And so her and her husband, they, too, enter into the temple. And they're overwhelmed with the noise. They're overwhelmed by the hustle and the bustle. And they move away from the crowds into a secluded booth. And they go into that secluded booth for a reason. They need to buy two pigeons. Deep down, I mean really deep down, they would have loved to buy a lamb. A spotless lamb. A blameless lamb. But they can't. They give the most that they can give to fulfill the least that the law requires. They don't have a choice. Because Joseph is not a wealthy man. He's a simple carpenter. He makes tables. He makes chairs. But as a carpenter... He doesn't make much money. 
as the merchant reaches out to line his pockets, Joseph reaches down to empty his. The young couple turns to dedicate their son to the Lord. And there's an old fellow by the name of Simeon. He moves with a sense of confidence towards the young couple, and he reaches out for their child. Mary looks at the old, weathered man, wrinkled face, wrinkled skin, frail demeanor. And Mary wonders, if it's okay. Could I place my precious child into the hands of this old, frail man? Well, cautiously, ever so cautiously, she hands Simeon her child. And she stands there and she's amazed at his strength. She's amazed at his gentleness. More than anything, she's amazed at his focus. And then it happens. Simeon's eyes fill with tears. Can you imagine that moment? All that time waiting. All that time longing. And he's holding the Messiah in his hands. I've done many baby dedications. And to hold a precious child in your hands and realize that you're in a place to, to dedicate this child into the hands of the Lord to mediate between the parents and the living God as you stand in the gap with that. A lot of little babies. And a lot of moms, that too, look with a certain sense of fear as they go to hand the baby into this big gorilla's arms. But that moment, Simeon's been there before. Time after time, child after child. But this ordinary day, it's different. And recognizing the moment, can you imagine the emotions and the expression on this old man's face? Tears starting to stream down and the glow in his countenance. No simple moment here in the pages of Scripture. How many of us have read the Christmas narrative and blown by this moment? This most incredible, incredible moment. He's lived his life to see him. And he's lived to hold the Savior in his arms. And the eyes that were once so dim. Now gaze amazingly and intently upon Christ. He knows this is the child who brings peace. This is the child who consoles. This is the child who will reign. This is the child, the baby, that can save the living soul. This is the child who brings God to man and brings man to God. And he's lived his entire life for this moment, and now the moments come. And he gently, ever so gently, hands the child back to his mother and stands there in silence. And Scripture tells us, that in that moment, Mary, too, stands in awe. And she stands and she ponders. And she ponders the promises and she ponders Simeon's continence. And she wonders why 
He's smiling so brightly. And Simeon knows why he's smiling. He has seen the Savior. And in so doing, having had that encounter with the Savior, Simeon proclaims that he can now die in peace. Pretty profound statement. That's how history happens. It's how it happens in the moment. God takes the ordinary and makes it extraordinary. Takes a typical day and in his sovereign timing creates a timeless moment. Ever had a moment like that? Where you waited? And you waited, and you waited, and you waited, and you waited. And it seemed like forever. Till the days on the calendar just roll by, and you flip the page, and it's another year, and another day, and it just continues on and on and on and on. Just a whole bunch of ordinary days. And you get to the place where you're just about ready to give up and let go. And then God shows up and responds. I waited a long time for a wife, 30 plus years, praying like a madman. Oh, God, I'll be single forever. I'll die a single man at Moody Bridal Institute. And then I walked into church one day, and there she was. Just visiting a friend. I'm convinced she was there to meet me. Just an ordinary day, just another church service. Just showing up as usual. Kind of giving up on the whole idea. So the Lord, I'd be content. And then the Lord surprised me. God takes the mundane. And when the moment's right, creates a miracle. God took the landscape of Simeon's life and prepared him for eternity. And the moment Christ appeared before his eyes, he found peace for his soul forever. Because that's what Christ came to do. To change everything. And to make everything new. It's a story about Roaring Camp, the mining town. Back in the day, known for its brawling Brutality, cursing, drinking, a whole lot of fighting. The community consisted of all men and one woman. Her name was Cherokee Sal. She dies giving birth to a little baby. And the men don't know what to do. They go 80 miles, 80 miles travel. So that they could get a hand carved cradle. They traveled to get lace and silk blankets. They see the dirty floors and the cabins and, and they clean them all up and they clean the walls. And they actually clean their hands. And then they clean up their speech. Before too long, they clean up their drinking. As soon the general store starts selling out of soap and shampoo and razors. Outside the mine, the men planted a garden. And they tended the flowers every day. Because a little baby 
changed the landscape of that community. A little baby changed the lives of men. That's what a baby can do. That's what Christ came to do. To change everything. And to make everything new. There's a word to describe what took place in this story. One simple word to describe what takes place in the incarnation. That word is convergence. It's the coming together of two things so that they would meet as one, to converge. Until they come together in unity, they come together in focus, they come together in purpose, and they come together in design. With the birth of Christ, an old man and a young woman converge in the holy city. And they converge because of their faith in God. They converge because of the promises of God. They converge because they heard the voice of God, the direction of God, the leading of the Holy Spirit. And a specific point in time and, and a place, in a moment, God brings them to the place of convergence. And they converge because God has chosen to fulfill his word through them. And they converge because all the hopes and the dreams that they have ever known all converge in Christ. With the birth of Christ, God and man converge in a relationship of grace and a relationship of love. It's the bringing it all together. What Mary and Joseph knew, what Simeon knew, and all of his wisdom is that God longed to be in relationship with him, longed to be and longs to be in relationship with us. And so deep is that longing. The scripture tells us God left all of his glory in that heavenly abode to come and live among us, to converge, to walk before us, to live among us, to reflect the very essence of God, the very nature of God. To bring clarity, to bring the promises of God complete, to converge. We as Christians need to learn the language of love. And Philip Yancey has a special way with words and I think provides a great, great explanation of this whole process. He writes of the typical student learning a foreign language, maybe Spanish, maybe French, maybe Greek, maybe Hebrew. And so they take the class because they have to. It's required. They need it to graduate. And so they slave away, learning one word after another, They write out all the little cards, and believe me, I've been there. You write all the little cards, you try to memorize each word, you try to memorize each meaning so that you can pass the test and you can pass the quiz. And then you start to put all those words together in in little phrases, and before too long, you can actually complete a sentence, and you work at it, and you work at it. Most students don't like it. If you ever learned a language, seems very unnatural to us all. But any student knows that you do it because you have to. Anyone who's ever studied Greek or Hebrew, and I have, you, you can relate to the toil that is involved in the learning process. It's a language of rules. It's a language of discipline. It becomes a language of drudgery and a language of duty. But then if you're a student and you're learning that and you're grinding it out and you're trying to learn Spanish so you can get an A, the end can never come soon enough. And then a young man learning Spanish meets a young, gorgeous Spanish young lady, a senorita. Now the only barrier to learning the language is he cannot assimilate it quick enough. The only barrier to learning the language is that he can't get enough of it. 
He wants to know the language, desperately know the language, because he wants to know her. <clears throat> With the birth of Christ, we're called to learn the language of love and the language of grace and the language of truth. And we begin to follow him because we want to know him more and more each day. We're not burdened by the duty, but the deep desire to know him more intimately. <clears throat> we don't approach the word like we're learning some foreign language, but rather having fallen head over heels in love with our Lord, we realize his word communicates all that he is to us and all he is for us. And because of our relationship with him, we can't learn it fast enough. We can't take it in deep enough. And so through Christ, God introduces us to the language of his son. With the birth of Christ, heaven and earth converge in time and space. God becomes a man to reach down to the depths of man's depravity to rescue us. Becomes a man to show us what God is like. To show us what God looks like. To show us the very heart of God himself. And to show us the face of God in Christ. Convergence. And Simeon knew that with all his heart. He knew that he was looking into the face of the living God. In Christ, God brought heaven to earth so that he could bring us to heaven. That's the eternal plan. It's always been the plan. It's the only plan he's ever offered. That he came to us in his son, Jesus Christ, to converge heaven and earth and to reach down and to pull us up. There was a family who was out vacationing at a lake one summer. Dad had been puttering out by the boathouse. And two of his sons, a 12-year-old and a 3-year-old, were down playing along the dock. Picture the imagery. The 12-year-old was supposed to be watching his little brother, but he got distracted. The 3-year-old, little Billy, Thought it'd be a good time to check out that shiny aluminum fishing boat tied up at the end of the dock. So he went to the dock and put one foot on the boat, one foot on the dock, and lost his balance, fell into the water. Well, the water was about five to six feet deep. And little Billy, not quite that tall. Well, the splash alerted the 12-year-old who let out a piercing scream. When Dad came running from the boathouse, jumped into the water, swam down, unable to see anything, finally comes up for air. Can you imagine? Sick with panic, dives right back down into the murky water, began to feel groping everywhere around the bottom, desperate, desperate to find his boy. Couldn't feel anything. Finally, on his way up, he felt little Billy's arms. And they're locked in a death group on one of the posts of the dock. He's just gripping it with all that he had. This little baby boy hanging on for all of his life. He's about four feet under the water. The dad pries the, the little boy's fingers loose. Both of them burst up together through the surface Gasping for air, gasping for breath. And finally, when the adrenaline stopped surging and the nerves had calmed down just a little bit, the father asked his son, what on earth were you doing down there hanging out of that post for so long under that water? What were you doing? And little Billy's answer is a classic. <clears throat> Laced with the wisdom only a toddler could give. He said,
I was just waiting for you, Dad. I was just waiting for you. Holding on. Waiting for you. Knowing you'd come. Knowing you'd rescue. Knowing you'd come get me. That's what God has done through his son. Dove down into the depths of humanity to rescue the drowning. We need to be like that child. Just waiting for you, Daddy. Just waiting for you. Not thrashing, not tangled up in all the weeds, not all that stuff. Holding on to the cross. Holding on to the cross. Holding on to the cross. Just waiting for you, Daddy. Isn't that the way life is? Isn't that the way it feels sometimes? Lord, I'm down here and I'm just in the thick of it. But I'm holding on to the cross. I'm holding on to the cross. Lord, come quickly. Come get me, Daddy. And we hold on to the promises. So in the midst of an ordinary day, just one day, Daddy's going to come. With the birth of Christ, faith and fate converge in the hearts of men. Simeon proclaimed, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and for the rise of many. It will converge. And the truth of who he is and why he came will serve as a sword that will cut to the sword. You can drown or you can be rescued. It all determines what you do with the cross. All converges at the cross. And how we respond will reveal our hearts and determine one's eternity. One moment in time. One decision for all time determines the destiny of the human soul. Simi knew the only choice that matters in life is to embrace the Savior. And when you embrace the Savior, only then can you ever say, let thy servant depart in peace. Isn't that what it's all about, men and women? Just an ordinary day. But some of you have tarried through life and you feel like Simeon and life is over. I'm here to tell you it's not. And just when you think it's all over, will God show up and show you the extraordinary. And then when he's done with what he wants to do and his purposes for your life, We've had the moment. Then God will probably gently and peacefully bring you home. But until he does that, your ordinary days are leading you someplace, men and women, and you don't want to miss the moment. I don't know about you, but for me, that's worth living for. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this morning I pray that as we focus our attention on communion, our Lord's Supper. It is a moment of convergence. <clears throat> it's a moment where we all come together in unity. We all come together in faith. We all come together in a sense to the cross. We come together to honor and to worship your Son, to remember you, Lord Jesus, to contemplate all that you've done, to celebrate your resurrection, to celebrate your reign and your rule. But we converge 
in communion. And so I pray that you will tend to our hearts this morning, that we will bring whatever sin, whatever dirt, whatever debris, we'll bring before you and we will lay it down, confess our sins, trust that you'll wash over us, restore us, renew us, Revive us, I pray, within our beings. Father, I pray, help us to realign here this morning and strengthen us, I pray, this day. Encourage us today, I pray. But help us to center ourselves and our souls here this morning as we partake of communion as we come before your throne, Lord Jesus, and we partake of the bread and the cup, may we be reminded of all that you've done on our behalf, all that you want to do for our behalf. And may we then leave here this day, an ordinary day, and allow you to do some extra nor extraordinary things not just in our lives, but through our lives into the life of others. We commit all this to you in Christ's precious name. Amen.